Hi, welcome to Senior Strategies. My name is Amy Decker, and I am Director of Client Services for Senior Helpers. We have a great show planned today, and I think it's going to be very interesting because it's going to be talking about healthy feet, how to keep your feet healthy, and how important it is that healthy feet actually affects the whole rest of your body. So we're going to talk about how often you should have your feet looked at, things that you should and shouldn't be doing. We're going to have Dr. Allie Slater, who's a podiatrist. And then we have Mr. Joe LaRocca, and he's a podorathist. And what he does is puts together um, orthotics for your shoes or even can modify your shoes so that if you've got issues with neuropathy um, or there's a wound that's been hurting or you've got a fallen arch, he can put things together to make walking for you much better. So we're excited to share this information with you today, and we hope that you get something out of this. Thanks for coming. Welcome to Senior Strategies, Tools for the Caregiver with Amy Decker and Shane Silver. Join us on each show where you're going to enjoy a lively conversation that's going to connect you to the tools and resources that you'll need to coordinate care for the seniors in your life. We are so happy that you joined us. Hi, welcome to Senior Strategies. Uh, we are gonna have some really great guests on today. Um, we're gonna be talking about the importance of keeping healthy feet and having healthy feet and how really the, the health of your feet is the overall health of your whole body. So the importance of keeping those appointments, making sure that your loved ones are having their feet looked at on a regular basis and what can happen if you don't do that. So today we have Dr. Allie Slater, she's a podiatrist, and she's going to be talking about the challenges that she sees um, just being out in the field, even as a mobile doctor, what she sees when people are, you know, they're homebound, they can't get out. And that's one of the first appointments is they probably give up is to have their feet looked at. And then we have Joe LaRocca with Joe LaRocca Shoes. He's a podorathist, and that is somebody that puts together, did I say it right? Podorathist? Yes. And that's somebody that works on orthotics for your shoes or can do things with your shoes so that if you are having issues with your feet, um, it's more comfortable for you, um, whether you're diabetic or you have neuropathy. Um, so it's a great show that we're going to be having um, two fun guests with lots to learn. So Allie, let's start with you, first of all. How did you get into this field and what do you find there are some of the biggest challenges that you deal with right now? So um, thank you so much for having us on today, first off. And uh, the way that I got into podiatry, my introduction to it was actually my ballet history. I grew up doing ballet and almost all dancers had some type of injury in their feet at some point or another. So I found myself my way into a podiatrist's office. The problem got solved right away, which has always been something really intriguing about our field is that some things can be fixed right away. Some things take longer. And when I went to college, I just kind of always had the career stuck in my brain. I found out that um, podiatrists, they go to school for four years, do a three-year surgical residency, and then practice both primary care and surgical care of the foot and ankle when I got out. So I thought it was a really interesting profession, and I still take care of dancers to bring it back full circle. Yeah, that's great. And there's so much involved with feet. I think people don't realize just what's involved in keeping healthy feet and what you have to do and what happens if you neglect them. Like, what are some of the stories that you have of people that have just put things off so long? I've seen anything and everything, to be honest with you. But most of the time, when you talk about those things, those really dramatic stories about neglect, it, it ends up being people with infections. And a lot of our patients are immunocompromised in some way, or they just, their soft tissue envelope has declined due to aging. They may not have the same vascular status and little things, little wounds can become very massive infections. And so and neglect, those are the most, yeah. yes, most extreme cases that we see when we talk about people neglecting to take care of their feet. How often would you say someone should have their feet looked at? Um, you know, whether they live in a private home or they live in a local community, how often, if they're not already having issues, would it be smart for their feet to be looked at? So there's a population of people that needs to be seen every two to three months, and those are our at-risk patients. So important to talk about this first. Those are your patients who are diabetic, they have neuropathy, they're on blood thinners, 
They have musculoskeletal disorders that prevent them from being able to take care of their feet. They're homebound, wheelchair bound. Those are our at risk patients and they need to be seen every two months. And many of those patients do know that they're supposed to be a podiatrist. But if you are healthy, you have no foot pathology, then I recommend at least once a year, just take them, have someone take a look at your feet and make sure everything's okay. If you do have pathology and issues, then that visit is going to become more frequent. And you look at everything from the knee down, correct? That's right. So the official scope of practice in the state of Florida is from the tibial tuberosity, which is that bony prominence just below your knee in all the way down to your toes. Mm -hmm. And so just keeping proper um, feet health, like getting pedicures even, making sure your toenails are clipped, watching that you don't get ingrown toenails. Those types of things have to be a, a plus. So we are, get a little bit worried when we talk about uh, pedicures, actually. Okay. It's good that you bring that up. So foot maintenance, really important. Something that you should do yourself at home. You should look between your toes at least a few times a week, make sure there's no maceration, particularly in warmer states like Florida. People tend to get sweaty and they tend to get fungal infections in there. And that can actually lead to hospitalization and cellulitis. So those are things that you can look out for. Um, when it comes to the trimming of the nails, if you are an at-risk patient, you should really be leaving that up to professionals. A podiatrist, a physician should be looking at that because what we're doing is a lot more than cutting of the nails. We're actually doing a full evaluation. Um, with pedicures, we'd rather you, uh, if anything, just polish. Don't let them cut. Don't let them trim. Don't let them scrape anything. The best way around that is if patients are insistent on it, let us do the cutting and trimming, go there, do not soak and let us just do the polish or let them just do the polish. Nice. Good to know. I saw a question on my next door app and she said um, that she wanted to go to the podiatrist to have her feet looked at, but she wondered also if you could do their fingernails. Are you able to do that too or no? No, not in the state of Florida. That is we're not in our scope of practice, believe mm -hmm. it or not. So it's wound care, anything on the leg that's considered wound care or, or, you know, like I said, ingrown toenails, those types of things. Right. Yes, absolutely. Good. And so then once you see a situation where you feel that that patient would need um, either orthotics or a shoe modification, what would be going on with that person um, for you to alert Joe that something's coming up? So it tends to be when you're talking orthotics, there's some type of foot deformity that we're looking at, whether it's they have prominent pain in the metatarsal area, um, if they have chronic plantar fasciitis, that kind of thing. Um, additionally, neuropathy is a great reason to get someone in what we call a pair of plastido inserts, which is like a diabetic top cover that is really excellent for protection. So that's when we're calling on him to say, hey, can you make us a device that's going to offload this patient, whether it's to take care of their pain or be a preventative measure for complications down the road. Explain what um, plantar fasciitis is. How do you get that and what is it? And what does it feel like? The really common problem that people have, um, and it can happen from a variety of reasons, but almost anything and everything. So whether you gain weight, lose weight, get new shoes, have too old of shoes, walk around too much one day, try a new activity. It can be many, many things that can cause it. But what it is, is the ligament that runs along the bottom of your foot. So it runs from your heel bone down into your toes and it has a connection with your Achilles tendon. So we find tight Achilles tendons tend to create increased tightness in the plantar fascia. It's an inflammatory condition. The good news is that most people do get better from it. Good. And about the 85% of patients do improve from it. And one of my most favorite things to do for the treatment of plantar fasciitis is to get patients in the pair of orthotics. It's not just for the, um, it's not just for treating the acute problem, it's for the maintenance care of that mm -hmm. patient. So really what you're looking at too is very intricate. I know at one point, and I don't know how I got it, but I had a Baker cyst in my knee that Dr. Eggerman was able to look at. And what causes that? And that was like one of the most painful things I've ever had was mm -hmm. a baker cyst. But so not only are you aware of what's going on with feet, toes, ankles, and you also work with what's going on in a knee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes we do. So a lot of times people find a baker cyst in the back of the knee as an incidental finding, believe it or not. 
on like an ultrasound, like if you have an ultrasound to make sure that you don't have a blood clot in your leg, that's one of the most common times that we end up finding those. They can be painful or not painful. They take up space. So any kind of cyst, it can cause pain and inflammation. Mm -hmm. Oh, it hurt. I remember getting out of the car. I like pivoted my knee and I thought someone shot me with an arrow. So they're painful. So great. So now, Joe, let's talk to you. How did you get into this? What, what prompted you to decide that this is the field that you wanted to be in? Well, as a, as a kid growing up, my family was in the retail shoe business. Uh, my father in particular was very, very well known in the orthopedic industry. He worked with Dr. Dudley Morton, Dr. Henry Kessler, uh, some of the, some of the bigger names in, in foot health. Um, so growing up in the retail end of, of the shoe business kind of led me right into the orthopedic end. We moved to Florida um, and opened our store in 1984. Wow. Uh, it, was, it was strictly orthopedics. As time went on, we became a little more uh, varied in the types of footwear that we were able to use to go with orthotics. Um, so I'd say over the last 15 to 20 years, the shift has come from just comfort shoes to actually doing a lot of wound care for people with diabetes. So um, pretty much what we do now is we we treat people that have uh, infections in their feet. When the doctors send them to us, it's usually to offload pressure points and to see if we can alleviate the pressures that create the wounds that create the amputations. That's great. So again, with your shoes, you probably have anything from, um, like you said, plantar fasciitis, maybe ingrown toenails, maybe um, at some point people that are diabetic, if they don't take care of their feet, they end up having um, amputations. So that's probably when you have to step in and and then modify their shoe, which I think that's a wonderful art that you're able to do that. You know, everybody's feet are different. So everybody's problems are going to be different. And so you've got the gift to be able to create something that they can wear that's going to make them feel better. That's correct. We um, have to convince them, number one, that what we're dealing with is a serious condition. Mm -hmm. And number two, that they have to be willing to wear shoes that they may not find attractive, mostly sneakers, which fortunately nowadays that people are pretty mainstream wearing sneakers most of the time, we're able to have a, a footwear that will accommodate the appliances that we have to fabricate to put into those into those shoes in order to, to remove pressure. Mm-hmm. And I would say that our success rate is extremely high if we catch the patient early enough and if the patient is compliant. We have had conditions where we had one particular patient that was completely healed uh, went to the beach barefoot, got third degree burns on the bottom of his feet, oh, no. and it came right back to the starting gate. Oh. Uh, again, we'll spend another year getting that patient healthy so that his feet would be able to function as a foot should, only to find out that the next year he went and did it again. <laughs> so I would say one of the one of the hard things that we have to do is to convince the patient of how serious the condition is. Right. And so then they they know to take it serious and wear the shoes they're supposed to wear. What about people that have had, uh, I've heard of some that have suffered from something called a fallen arch. What causes that? And can you make an orthotic so that their arch then has support? Because when I think of your foot, I think of the top of your foot's the arch, but it's probably the part that's under, what causes a fallen arch? Well, it's funny. You, you reminded me of a Cheers episode where the mailman asks the bartender if he's been dating the woman long enough to buy her a set of arch supports. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and along the short of that story is that as we age, our, our arches do drop. Um, um, the tendons don't stretch, so the foot becomes inflamed and... Uh, Arch supports can be very, very helpful in terms of not having the condition progress, 
but once once the foot starts to need an arch support, it's it's not going to regenerate. So that's where we come in, and uh, Dr. Slater, Dr. Eggerman will write us prescriptions for different types of orthotics or arch supports. But um, typically, everyone should have an arch support in their shoe because nobody has a shoe that's really designed to make full contact with the bottom of the foot and the shoe. Makes sense. Cause if you look at, if you get your feet wet or even walk on the sand, you see your footprint and you always see that middle part of it's not touching. So there's nothing right. there to support that. And I assume that your investigation um, or as you're triaging this patient is far more in depth than the little kiosks that they have like at Walmart where you take your shoes off and stick them in the and you stand on it and they go, oh yeah, you need support number 52 for your shoe, go get those. <laughs> how, what they base that on. But I assume, Allie, same for you, that your, your investigation is far, what sort of investigations do you do to find out what's going on with your feet? It's pretty comprehensive. I mean, the first thing that you do is you listen to the patient and what their complaint is, and then you get kind of an idea. And then we almost always take x-rays of patients to get an idea of the bone structure itself. And then you wanna see the foot working in action. So I have patients stand up from the chair. I have them weight bear, do a little walking around the room. I look at the position of the forefoot, the, the first half of the foot. And then I look at the back of the heel and see how they respond. I look for things like the terminology that people may have heard before, pronation, supination, rolling in, rolling out of the ankles. And it really, the treatment and pathology depends on that. I mean, there's so many different types of foot structures out there. It's not a one size fits all recipe, um, at least from where I stand for recommendations for what I would like to see uh, patients in for support. And then when you have a really good pedorthis on your side, you guys can work together to find out what's going to work the best for that patient. Sometimes there is a sort of academic approach that you take to a patient and it turns out they don't tolerate that in the real world and you have to make adjustments. So it's really good to have somebody that you can work with as a team to get it exactly right to what the patient needs. Yeah, that's what I would think it takes a village to be able to get. Again, nobody's feet are the same. So Joe, once they get to you, then I assume you've got records of the x-rays and everything else is going on. And then you probably have to do your own investigative work, I assume. Absolutely. Um, pes planus, which is flat feet, it can be a real challenge because most of those patients have a posterior tibial tendon that's either about to rupture or has ruptured. So they have no stability. And that being said, putting an arch in their shoe will half cripple them because their foot's so flat to begin with. So what we have to do is determine how much of an arch support we can give them, but also to post the orthotic in such a way that it will uh, work as an anti-pronation device as well. Uh, to, to just put an arch support into a shoe with somebody with flat feet They'll be crying before they make it to the door. So well, yeah, it probably uh, feels like you're walking on a with a rock in your shoe. Exactly. And that's exactly what they yeah. say. And mm -hmm. so what we do is very much similar to uh, what Dr. Slater had suggested. We we first of all, we do a visual examination. I typically uh, will will do a a an examination of the ankle to see how much mobility there is. And at that point, when I watch them walk, we kind of make a determination as to um, whether to try to give them a little extra arch support or, or just accommodate what they do have for a flat foot and post with uh, a medial on the inside to mm -hmm. keep the foot from, from um, going to the ground. Right. What would you say in all the years that you have done this is the worst case scenario challenge that you've ever had to deal with? Well, I had I had a case where a fellow was a race car driver and uh, both of his feet were amputated from oh. the ankle down. And um, he wanted me to make him a pair of shoes, but he had no feet. So, so what we did was we made him a device um, that was more like a brace than it was a shoe, but it had little pads on the bottom 
And to this day, this guy runs around wearing these uh, wow. these devices, and he's still able to to race his cars. Wow! And how does he have the shoe fit onto his foot? There's like a, just a little prosthetic that holds onto the ankle. Uh, yes, it's more like a brace. It's it's basically like an Arizona brace, but where the part would go onto the foot, oh. we just have a, a round landing pad. So he's literally got about six inches on each foot of round um, circum, circum, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, a round circle. And um, he, he's able to balance on that. That's great. So you've actually made it a huge impact on his life. You've changed his life. Yeah, that's what he tells me. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great. And you know, for all the years that you've been at it, if you have a few of those stories where you've change somebody's life around just by making sure their feet are comfortable and they can still get around. That's huge. Ellie, how about you? What would you say so far has been your biggest horror story that you've had to deal with or a really good story that you were able to help somebody? <laughs> um, well, it's hard to think of, of one in particular, um, but the biggest thing that I see is these patients with the wounds and getting them healed. I mean, I think one horror story that comes to mind is a patient I had, I was on call at one of the hospitals and she had um, what we call gas gangrene of her foot, but she already had an amputation of the other side. And she wanted to, of course, keep her, her leg. She had a, a limb threatening infection on the side that was still there. And so we worked together forever. I mean, in many cases, this would be something that a patient, some other doctors may have jumped to an amputation, but we worked really diligently and we were doing grafting and we took bone biopsies. We did IV antibiotics, everything, anything and everything that we could do to save her limb. And I have many patients that have been in that situation, whether it's they have one limb or they're immobile already. And we know that amputations can significantly impact somebody's longevity. Uh, and so it's a lot of stories like that of practicing limb salvage, being able to successfully heal somebody's wound and get them to be able to ambulate. It not only saves their leg, but it can really save their life. Right. And enhance their life. And so most cases, if they're looking at a gangrene or they're looking to lose a limb, that's in most cases, am I wrong? Is that because they're diabetic and the, and the circulation and everything isn't because I remember I you spoke about something and why sugar affects the healing in the legs. What was that? That so diabetic patients are probably the most common population for this, but there's different reasons that that could happen. So it's not always diabetes. It could be that someone has severe peripheral vascular disease. It can also be a trauma. I mean, I've had patients from motorcycle accidents. Uh, that have limb threatening issues that lose some of their critical arteries, the critical blood supply to the foot and ankle that have essentially mangled limbs. Um, so it can be a bunch of causes, but what we see as truly we would call it an epidemic is, is diabetic patients with neuropathy and poor circulation is just a perfect storm uh, to brew some of these really crazy problems. So there is a theory that the sugar in the blood, having elevated blood sugar, that sugar, think of it as something sticky. It sort of tacks onto everything and it tacks onto all these different structures and makes it slower. So your blood vessels, uh, they, they don't function optimally. Things in the body start to function less optimally over time. It's progressive and it gets worse. It can be improved with imp improved glycemic control. So if someone is starts controlling their blood sugar, things can turn around, of course, but we often get involved when it's too late because sometimes the complications from diabetes or peripheral vascular disease happen once you can see them, you've reached a really late stage in the game. Right, because don't their feet at some point, they're numb. So they might not even know that they have a, 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 an open sore down there and they wait too long to get it looked at. And yet if you wait too long to get it treated, that can be fatal to somebody, I understand. Yes, I think that neuropathy is probably the most challenging diagnosis that we treat because it has so, there's so many complications that result from it. And most of it is that 
you lose your pain receptors. Mm -hmm. Pain is a totally normal and necessary function of our bodies to tell us when we're overdoing it. And the second you use lose that pain sensation, what we call your protective thresholds, you're immediately more vulnerable and at risk for complications. So an example would be, I once saw a diabetic patient in the office that came in. She said, my foot is really swollen. I don't know what happened. I just wanted you to come in and take a look at it. I took an x-ray and there was a four inch sewing needle through her, between her third and fourth metatarsal. She had no idea, what? no recollection, no idea that it happened. What? Nothing. Because she was severely neuropathic and oh. we were lucky because I was able to get it out pretty easily, but she hadn't the slightest clue. That's obviously not a normal response. And it was in her foot or it shish kebabbed her toes together? It was <laughs> in between the metatarsals. So the bones behind your toes, like in the space, she actually oh, got pretty right. lucky where it went. It was right in between the space of two bones and it came out easily, but those kinds of things, if, if for instance, she had gotten that into the bone, that could have led to a bone infection. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. And so mm -hmm. Joe, once somebody comes to you and they need an orthotic or they need a shoe, um, modified to make their feet feel better, how long does it take you to be able to get that product to them so they can start feeling relief? Sometimes it's immediate. We're able to do the correction right at the facility. Uh, other times it may take a week, uh, mm -hmm. 10 days, depending upon what it is we have to do. Uh, we, we do a lot of four foot fillers for people that have had transmetatarsal amputations. Uh, so at that point, what we have to do is we have to take the mold. Uh, we still do it the old fashioned way. We fill the mold with plaster. We make a replica of the foot and then we fabricate the device to go into a shoe that has been prearranged by us to accommodate the, the insert. But typically it doesn't take us more than a week because those patients that are in need, especially the ones with open ulcers, really don't have time to waste. And that's, right, right. that's uh, time is definitely of the essence when it comes to healing. Absolutely. And, and so there's very some new often products. probably when they come to you, um, their foot's going to be swollen. It's going to be maybe disfigured. So you're going to take the mold, you're going to make the shoe. And then how often do you need to go back and look at it again? Because now the swelling may have gone down. So you've got to modify the shoe. How often do they have to come back to you? just to make sure that shoe every, is doing its thing. Every case is different. We like to have a follow-up usually within a week after we've made the product, because mm -hmm. again, the patient most of the time can't tell how it's working uh, right. unless they visually do an inspection. Interestingly enough, one of the companies that we distribute products from actually put a mirror on the lid of the, of the shoe box so that the patient can open up the box and put their foot next to the mirror and actually see what's happening with their foot. Oh wow! Uh, so many people that are that are home alone don't have anybody that can take a look and tell them that this or that is happening. So yeah, like the woman with the sewing needle in her foot, mm -hmm. she must have exactly. been single. <laughs> it's a horrible story, but I think it's great. And I think like with anything else, you know, you talk to a dentist. And they're so happy for somebody to come in and have issues with their teeth or missing teeth. And they walk out with such self-confidence. I think same with feet. They come in, they're miserable. They can't walk. They've lost their feet. They're not feeling good that you're both able to fix them in a way to give them self-esteem again and move back on with their life. And so I think what you both do is, is a very rewarding thing to do. You don't think of your feet as being something that's as important as they are, but that's how we get around. That's how we ambulate. That's, and again, like anything else, the, he the health of your teeth, the health of your feet, your limbs, all of that affects your entire body and the importance of keeping an eye on your feet. And like I said, I think it's one of the things that people push aside along with their teeth when they are staying at home or they're, they're bed bound, or they don't know that they can have somebody come to their home and look at them and, and be looked at. And uh, they wait until it's, a really ugly emergency before they call out to the both of you to get the assistance that they need. So I think you're great. My, I think what you both do are wonderful. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you. My motto is limp in and leap out. Oh, that's cute. 
Do you have do you have merch that says that like t-shirts and stuff? <laughs> no. Yes, yeah, sure. That's a cute. No, we let the cute. patients speak for themselves. Yeah, I think it's great. And I think um, so, Joe, if somebody locally or we've got viewers all over the US, the UK and Canada, if they wanted to get in touch with you to get an idea of what you could do for themselves or their loved ones, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, probably to respond to our website. It's, okay. Um, Florida Fedorthics Laraka Shoes at gmail.com. You can find us at um, footankledelray.com. That's footankledelray.com and call up and make an appointment. And many times, especially for urgent things, we are able to accommodate within a day or two, uh, particularly in our at-risk population. So we want to make sure you're seen and taken care of. Right. So they can either make an appointment to come into your office or very often if they're not able to get out, you're able to go to see them wherever their location is. Absolutely. For patients who are homebound and they're not able to, to get out of the house, we do make home visits. So you can reach us the same way and let us know that that's your situation and we'll come out and see you there. I think it's great. And I think what both of you do is wonderful. And I'm happy that you are on my show this time. I think if anybody's got any questions or concerns, feel free to put that in the messaging underneath where the show is going to be posted on Facebook and Instagram. And I'll be sure to get that to, uh, to Dr. Allie and to Joe. Um, if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask us, we, we welcome those. But thank you so much for being on the program. And we look forward to having you on again, just to get some more success stories. Thank you, Amy. Thank you Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on Senior Strategies. We hope that you found the tools and the strategies that we offered you beneficial for your journey as a caregiver. We want you to leave today feeling empowered and supported. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for upcoming shows and events. For more information, to schedule a consultation, or to join a support group, please contact us at 561-800-6654. And remember the strategies and tools you can use to, to make, make your journey easier. easier.